It's here, an updated iPad Air. This time around, Apple is bumping up the processor to an M1 and improving the front facing camera. So let's check it out. Hello, I'm Brad. I review tech for creative professionals and we saw a major redesign of this iPad Air back in 2020. And as expected, this go around, we're seeing a nice little spec bump to what Apple has done before. So in some ways, this is not the most exciting iPad we've ever seen. It's not breaking any new ground, but I think when we look at the value for the price, this is one of Apple's better products. It feels like we're getting a pro-level iPad at a mid-level price. The main addition here is that M1 processor, which is currently the best processor that you can get in any iPad. And it's gonna be plenty fast for anything you're gonna to wanna to do on an iPad for years to come. Now, about a year and a half ago when the last Air came out, I saw a lot of you in the comments say that there were two things that were really important to you with the iPad. Number one was getting that Apple Pencil 2, which is a great quality of life upgrade over the original Apple Pencil. And the second thing was more storage. Now, for $150 more, you can bump up this iPad from 64 gigabytes of storage to 256. 256 is really good. If you're doing video production, you're probably gonna want more, but for art, illustration, even photo editing, 256 is great. So I saw many of you over the last year choosing the Air over the Pro because of the storage. And when you compare this new Air to the 11 inch Pro, they are very similar. We're talking about the same M1, same eight gigabytes of RAM, same Magic Keyboard and Apple Pencil compatibility. And so I think the main question is, what exactly are you giving up if you go with the Air over the Pro? The 11 inch Pro screen is just a touch bigger. It also has a higher refresh rate, 120 hertz. So you're gonna get smoother animations, better drawing performance, asterisk, gonna be testing that out in a few minutes. The max brightness on the Air is 500 nits, and on the Pro it's 600 nits. So it gets a little bit better there too. The camera array on the back of the Pro is beefier, has a LiDAR sensor in there and the storage configurations go all the way up to two terabytes. And with those higher storage configurations, like the one terabyte, two terabyte storage configurations, you're going to be getting 16 gigabytes of RAM instead of just eight. Along the top of the air, there is a fingerprint sensor on the on and off button. The Pro has the proper sensors along with the camera to use Face ID. Even though the Face ID is often treated as a more premium feature in Apple's ecosystem, I think I like the fingerprint reader a little bit better. Because when I'm drawing on the iPad, my face isn't always aligned with the camera, but when I'm turning on the iPad with my finger, that's always aligned with the button. It's also notable that the air comes in several different fun colors. This is the new blue. I think it looks pretty good. I, I'm also digging the darker blue folio case that came along with it. One of the big updates to the iPad Pro line last year was the upgrade to a mini LED display on the 12.9 inch Pro. It's worth noting here that that upgrade didn't make its way to the 11 inch Pro, at least not yet. So the screen that we see on the 11 inch Pro is very similar to the screen that we're seeing right here on the air, but there are some differences. I think the one that most people are going to miss the most is the refresh rate. I can tell when I'm minimizing apps or moving quickly through things that the animation is just smoother on the Pro. Is it necessary? No, I don't think so, but it is a cool feature. Boy, this Brad guy sure talks about drawing a lot. Yeah, it's kind of my thing. If you've been thinking about dipping your toe in the water, I have some beginners classes for you. My Intro to Procreate course has over 60,000 students. How is that? possible. These are amongst the highest rated drawing courses on Udemy. And there's a 30 day money back guarantee. And I will personally deliver a duck to your house if you use the discount codes down below in the description. I am so bad at selling. I'm not gonna give anybody a duck. That was a lie. Oh, in my affinity designer class, we draw zombies. If you're getting the iPad for art and illustration, the Apple Pencil is fantastic. It's just great to draw with. It's accurate, it's crisp, the pressure feels amazing. It's just one of those top of the line tools and it always has been. This is the second generation Apple Pencil that magnetically connects to the top of the iPad where it also pairs and charges. The Apple Pencil does not come with the iPad Air. It is an extra $130. If you're wondering if it might be worth getting, say, a cheaper stylus that promises a lot for a fraction of the price, no, no, it is no, don't do it. I've made entire videos on this. Some of those styluses might be okay if you're just going to be taking notes or just want to jot some things down on your iPad, but for drawing, the Apple Pencil is a must. I did want to talk a minute about drawing lag. Is this something you should be worried about because of the lower refresh rate on the iPad Air? And overall, I would say no. 
I think it's fine, but let's let's jump to some tests. The refresh rate is just one of the many factors that goes into composing drawing lag, or the amount of space between the tip of your pencil and where the line appears behind it while you're drawing. Some of the other factors here are the response time of the stylus. The Apple Pencil's pretty good there. And probably the most important but most underrated piece of this is just how well optimized the software is that you're using. And in general, the apps on the iPad are crazy well optimized to take advantage of the Apple Pencil. What you're looking at here is the iPad Pro and the iPad Air next to each other, and I have Procreate open. When I slow down the video, you could see that the Pro is a little bit better when it comes to drawing lag than the Air. Just a little bit. I like to do these slow down tests in my videos, not because it shows real world performance necessarily, but it just shows the difference between devices. Clip Studio Paint is another one of my favorite apps to draw in. And this app does a lot more than Procreate. It's also a port of a desktop app, so I find that there is more lag in this app than you might get in a native iPad app. As a side note, the best performance in this particular test that I have ever seen was just a few weeks ago when I was testing out the Samsung Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. But, and, and this is a big but, I only got this kind of crazy good performance when I was using Samsung's own Notes app. So if you want to draw on the Notes app and only use one kind of pen, there you go. You're going to get great performance there. But I do think this is a really good example of when you have a really lightweight app with a pen and hardware and software that is all optimized to work together, you can do amazing things. Just for fun here, I'm, I'm also showing off Clip Studio Paint. I'm drawing on the new Air and I'm drawing on the new Galaxy Tab S8 Ultra. Just as a side note, this was really hard to record. Moving both your hands at the same time back and forth on two different sized screens is really weird. So, are there any downsides to drawing on the iPad? Yes, I think there are. I, I think there's two. First, the iPad is a very shiny glass screen. It is a beautiful screen, and the Apple Pencil tip is really plasticky, and it, it's kind of slick to draw on this screen using the Apple Pencil. On top of that, something else that I notice is that when you get some finger oil on your screen, and you will get finger oil on your screen, the drag of the pencil can be inconsistent. Sometimes it could move really fast when you don't expect it to, and sometimes it can feel kind of chunky and weird. I don't have a screen protector on this iPad Air, but I do still have one on my 2018 iPad Pro, which is my daily driver, has been for three and a half years now. And personally, I do prefer the feel of the screen protector, even if it does dull the colors of the beautiful display just a little bit. The second thing is not every app runs on the iPad, and this is less and less of a problem over time. And this point probably deserves its very own segment. Let's talk about the app ecosystem. I think this is the main differentiator when we're talking about the iPad compared to Windows or compared to Android. For some pros who've been using the same desktop apps for years and have been using them every day, they are going to find a lot of what the iPad has to offer maybe a little limited. If you use Clip Studio Paint on the desktop and then you move over to the iPad, this is gonna be a pretty easy transition for you. Heck. You can even connect a Bluetooth keyboard to your iPad and use the shortcuts there. But if you're someone like me, who draws a lot in, say, Adobe Photoshop, jumping from the desktop over to the iPad version is going to be a big jump. Adobe's decided to break their apps out into kind of smaller micro apps. For example, they have an app called Fresco, which actually is a really good drawing app. But because there is its own dedicated drawing app, Adobe hasn't moved over many of those drawing tools on a desktop version of Photoshop over to the iPad yet. Now there's some apps like Procreate that exist on the iPad and only on the iPad. This is also the app that I've used mainly throughout my video and is my go-to drawing app for pretty much everything nowadays. I like the minimal interface, I like the way that everything gets out of the way, and I also like that every year they seem to be adding more and more features like animation or the ability to paint on 3D models. In the past, one of the main limitations of Procreate was how much RAM your iPad had. In order for Procreate to remain fast and stable what they did is they capped how many layers you could have based on your canvas size. Now in recent years, as iPads have gotten more and more RAM, this has been less of a problem because you've gotten access to more and more layers. And with this iPad having eight gigabytes of RAM, that's a lot, you're gonna get a lot of layers. So really, this is one of those problems that is kind of dissipated over time, and with this new iPad Air, isn't really a problem at all. There are a ton of other drawing apps on the iPad as well. 
Concepts, Medibang, Ibez Paint X, way too many to name. There are even pro level apps like Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, which are truly fully featured desktop competitors. Now so far, I haven't really touched much on peripherals, unless you count the iPad Pencil, which I have talked about a lot. The Magic Keyboard cover is still great. It is a little pricey. This one starts at $300 for this size. I am also a fan of the less expensive Folio cover, although that is kind of expensive for what it is. I think both of these things feel incredibly premium. I love typing on the Magic Keyboard. I also like how easy it is to transition between the two cases. The folio cover has two positions. The first is the content consumption position, and the second is more of a laid back drawing position. Overall, I think the upgrades that we've seen to this year's Air are really solid. If you already have an iPad with a Gen 2 Apple Pencil, I don't really think there's any need to upgrade yet, but this does feel like a pro level iPad at a non-pro price. And that is a huge win for anybody looking to upgrade for maybe an older iPad or maybe just jump into the iPad ecosystem for the first time. What do you think? Let me know down below in the comments. Thank you all for watching and I'll talk to you in a couple of days.